So another version of it is one, a male gene, which is pushing towards expression of a fetal enzyme, fetal lactogen, placental lactogen. And what that does is it makes it easier for the fetus to grab sugar out of the bloodstream from the mother. And the mother tries to counter it. And if she's not very effective at doing it, or if she's rather over-effective, you get pregnancy hypoglycemia, pregnancy diabetes. Suddenly, this is mom having a fight with her offspring over how much calories they're going to get, the offspring being driven by an imprinted gene from the father. Totally cool, totally interesting. There should be a problem lurking here, though, which is this is a pattern you only see in tournament species. You got a pair bonding species, and there's no reason why a male should be saying something like, ooh, I want to like, ruin her future reproductive success at the cost of her giving birth. I'm a, I'm a pair bonding vole, and I want her to give birth to a child the size of an elephant who's going to survive, and who cares about her future? They're pair bonding. They're in it together for the rest of time. You don't find imprinted genes in pair bonding species. You find imprinted genes in tournament species. And thus, we get back to that same issue the other day, looking at tournament versus pair. Where do humans fall into this? And what we've already seen is, if humans can come up with choriocarcinomas and things like that, we have imprinted genes. Same punchline again as the other day, in terms of the number of genes we have, puts us somewhere in between tournament and pair bonding species. Again, we are terribly confused. OK, let's take a five minute break and we will pick up with more examples. OK. Let's get going again. Uh, two good questions just now. One is, where does homosexuality fit into all of this? And where it fits in is about 30 minutes worth of the sexual behavior lecture sometime in mid-May. It is a challenge for some of this thinking. Uh, the second good question was, am I capable of speaking louder? I will try. I mumble. OK, pushing on. So we've just brought in this whole bizarre, unexpected world of trashing the hallmark cards of intersexual com competition. Another example of it, a really interesting one. This was work done by a guy named William Rice at Santa Cruz over some years looking at a number of different fly species. Female flies are polyandrous. They mate with a lot of different males. And you're a male who've just mated with a female. And what you would like more than anything in order to pass on copies of your own genes is like not have some other guy impregnate her, some other male fly guy who's intimidating you, not have some other guy do it. And suddenly what you see is this interesting world where because of the mating frequency of the females, she will have sperm from a number of different males inside her at the same time. And suddenly, we get this very strange world, a whole field of research of sperm competition. Sperm competition of relay teams and gold medals and all of that, of sperm competing with the sperm from other males. And what you see is, in fly species, the sperm of males make toxins that kill the sperm of other males. Whoa! That's very elegant. That's very elegant because it in part requires you to come up with a toxin that isn't toxic to yourself. You can solve that, all sorts of molecular tricks for doing that. But this makes wonderful sense. You increase the likelihood of you, the sperm, reaching the goal line and killing the other guys and all of that, except there is a problem for the females, which is these toxins that the male sperm release aren't such a hot deal for the female's health. And what Rice did were these really interesting studies. I won't go into the details of it in large part because I still don't understand what the guy did. But he was able to somehow take populations of male and female flies, and he would hold the females so that they could not evolve in response to whatever was going on with the males, male-male competition for reproduction, while he held constant the female-female competition. The females were not evolving. The males were. And what he saw over the course of 30 generations was this male-male sperm competition was such that the male sperm were making such powerful toxins that they were shortening the life expectancies of the females. 
Whoa, that's not smart. Whoa, that makes perfect sense. Houseflies are not your parabonding swans dying in each other's arms for life sort of organisms. It's a classic case of the male only has an investment in the current reproductive bout, and if he can wipe out the competitor's sperm, and oh, bummer, the female has now got all sorts of rotty necrotic lesions in her vagina. This is not a very reproductively effective female fly down the line. What do I care? I'm off to the next pile of cow dung after that. You have that same structure there, but this is a bummer for the females. The males left to their own competition will evolve more and more toxic sperm, which exacts more and more of a price on the future reproductive success of the females. Now, Rice flips things, and now he takes these populations, and he holds the male evolution constant and allows the females to evolve. And over the first course of 30 generations, they have evolved means of detoxifying the sperm. So here we have male-male competition inadvertently being played out in an intersexual realm as well, where again, this co-evolutionary arms race, totally bizarre, sperm killing each other and sperm damaging the female, and that makes no sense if you, you know, do for the good of the species. Again, very logical in the context of these models, these models of evolution.